Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Uh, But I'll be reading today from the message. Uh, Please stand for the Gospel reading. A man was sick, Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters went, sent word to Jesus, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. When Jesus got the message, he said, This sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's Son. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, but oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed on where he was for two more days. After the two days, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. They said, Rabbi, you can't do that. The Jews are out to kill you, and you're going back? Jesus replied, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daylight doesn't stumble because there's plenty of light from the sun. Walking at night, he might very well stumble because he can't see where he's going. He said these things and then announced, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up. The disciples said, Master, if he's gone to sleep, he'll get a good rest and wake up feeling fine. Jesus was talking about death, while his disciples thought he was talking about taking a nap. Then Jesus became explicit. Lazarus died, and I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. You're about to be given new grounds for believing. Now let's go to him. That's when Thomas, the one called the twin, said to his companions, Come along, we might as well die with him. When Jesus finally got there, he found Lazarus already four days dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, only a couple of miles away, and many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother. Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. Jesus said, your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. You don't have to wait for the end. I am right now, resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? Yes, Master. All along I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. After saying this, she went to see her sister Mary and whispered in her ear, The teacher is here and is asking for you. The moment she heard that, she jumped up and ran out to him. Jesus had not yet entered the town, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run off, they followed her, thinking she was on her way to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was waiting and fell at his feet, saying, Master, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews with her sobbing, A deep anger welled up within him. He said, Where did you put him? Master, come and see, they said. Now Jesus wept. The Jews said, Look how deeply he loved him. Others among them said, Well, if he loved him so much, why didn't he do something to keep him from dying? After all, he opened the eyes of a blind man. Then Jesus, the anger again welling up within him, arrived at the tomb. It was a simple cave in the hillside with a slab of stone laid against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. The sister of the dead man, Martha said, Master, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus looked her in the eye. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, 
you would see the glory of God? Then to the others, go ahead, take away the stone. They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and prayed, Father, I'm grateful that you have listened to me. I know you always do listen, but on account of this crowd standing here, I've spoken so that they might believe that you sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And he came out, a cadaver wrapped from head to toe and with a kerchief over his face. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him loose. That was a turnaround for many of the Jews who were with Mary, that they saw what Jesus did and believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. The story Dave just read to us is one of the most intriguing stories I find in Scripture, and I I think I do so because there are so many different people that respond to it in different ways. And yet, maybe they're not as different as we think. What I'd like to do in the next couple of minutes is talk about some of those individuals or groups, actually, of people and how they responded. First, there was the disciples. Now, these these people, these men, had walked with Jesus for three years. They watched him change water into wine. They watched as he healed the sick. They watched as he took just a few loaves and a few fish and fed thousands of people. They watched as he taught the the masses. They watched as he took a man who had been born blind and gave him sight. And now they learn that his good friend Lazarus has died. You know, what they did and what they said was purely human. And I don't say that in a negative way. Because they saw the situation and they weighed it and said, you know, Master, if we go back there, they're going to kill us. And Jesus responded and talked to them a little bit more and said, you know, we've got to go. God's going to do a mighty deed here. And it was Thomas who spoke with all the confidence in the world, Master, we're all going to go with you so we can die with you. Like I say, it would be easy to judge them because they were so human. Except the one thing I've realized is first century disciples and 21st century disciples are a lot alike. You see, we tend to look at the world from a more realistic perspective. In fact, I've heard that from people talking to me in the past. Well, Bob, we're realists. And you got to look at it this way. You know, one of the ways that we in the church are realist more than anywhere else is when it comes to money. Because we don't want to part with that. We don't want to have to struggle with that. So we're realist. As I was thinking about today, I got to thinking about a church that some of our members were connected with about eight or nine years ago. You see, we went on a volunteer's admission trip to Lumberton, North Carolina. And the last two years we were there, we stayed in this facility that was beautiful. They had a great multi-purpose room. They had this beautiful kitchen, which became the inspiration for some of us when we chose to renovate and rebuild our kitchen. And they They had this great facility, but when you talk to the people, they talked about what had happened. They were a thriving congregation and decided they needed to do this. But after they completed this project, they realized we're in a lot of debt. And so they began to think, okay, what can we cut? so we can continue to pay down the debt. 
and they decided, well, you know, we can cut staff. So the associate pastor that had been there for many, well, that position had been there for many years, suddenly was no longer there. And other staff positions suddenly were cut away, all in the thought of saving money so they could pay down the debt. You couldn't cut electric because, you know, the power company is going to want their money either way. The same with any other utility. So the easiest thing to cut is staff and ministry. But there's a problem with that. Can you imagine what the problem would be? You cut staff, you cut ministry, the people that come there because of the ministries that happen because of the staff that you have suddenly don't see those ministries anymore. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to go somewhere else where those ministries happen. So when we talked to them, they talked about how things haven't been too good lately. They have this beautiful facility, but not too many people coming anymore. You see, sometimes we're realists, but being a realist gets in the way of being a disciple, being a follower, being one who's going to grow the kingdom. The disciples were very human, just like the disciples today can be very human. Then there's Mary and Martha. The truth is, Mary and Martha are grieving. Their brother has died. I get it. Most of you know that a little over a year ago, my brother died. What you don't know is that my sisters and I had many a conversation in the days and weeks and months, even to this day, that followed. The conversations went like this. Why didn't he choose to be part of that study at Hopkins? Even though the doctor said you should continue with the treatment you're on now. That was October. Can you imagine how much better he might be today instead of dead had he done that study? Or when they noticed that his eyes were going bad, kind of deformed, why didn't they, instead of saying, oh, you probably have a sty and treat him, why didn't they immediately say, let's do a scan? That could be tumors behind the eye. But instead, he went two weeks, and the tumors really began to grow. Or when they saw that the tumors were growing, why didn't they say, we need to get on this new treatment, and we need to do it aggressively, we need to do it now, we can't sit around and wait for a few weeks? like they did. What are we doing when we do that? We're trying to explain it. We're trying to understand it. We're, we're pulling that game where, what if? I've done that in many occasions. I've done that with my father. I still think, 26 years later, what if they had done this? You see, that's a human response, too. And it's a normal response. We've all been there, probably. We've all asked those same questions and thought those same thoughts. So it's not odd that Mary and Martha would say to Jesus, Master, if you had been here, he would not have died. They're not pointing the finger. They're not accusing. They're simply stating a statement of faith. It's how they are understanding this situation. If Jesus would just have been there, Lazarus would still be alive. A human response we call grief. Then there's the crowd. And, and what I like about the crowd is the crowd is the same whether it's 21st century or 1st century or whether it's 10,000 years ago, B.C., you know, the crowd reacts as a crowd does. You have a group of people in the crowd that are like, come on, Jesus, you healed so many other people. If you hadn't been running around out there in the countryside somewhere, you could have been here and healed Lazarus. And then you have other people who look at 
this whole situation and they say, you know, he must have really loved him. Look at him. He's weeping. He's crying. And then you have people who just don't say anything. It's kind of like the crowds today, you know. You go to any kind of event, and you're, I'm going to be at Camden Yards tomorrow. You're going to have people chanting, let's go O's as loud as they can. And you're going to have some people going, let's go Blue Jays. And you're going to have some people who are going to sit there, and they're going to be, well, maybe I'll do that too, on their cell phones not caring what happens or reading a book. It's what happens in the crowd. And then there's Jesus. You know, I sometimes grapple with the scriptures. This is one of them. And I don't, I, I'll be honest, I haven't checked out the other one. I was going to do it between services and I didn't. I'm not real comfortable with Eugene Peterson's understanding, but he may be stating it from what he found and what other writers have found and translators have found. I don't think that Jesus was angry at any point in this story. That's just my own personal perspective. I think that Jesus was upset because a loved one had died. He was upset because he saw his friends going through all kinds of grief and agony. He was upset, but I don't think he was angry. But when Jesus realizes the magnitude, when he sees Mary and Martha in their grief, when he sees the crowd, when he's standing at the tomb, what does he do? He weeps. That, my friends, is probably the most human reaction in Jesus' entire ministry. And it reminds us that Jesus was fully human. Now, I know, because I've had it happen to me, there are people out there that want to point out to us Jesus was fully divine. And they will take anything and everything to point out the divinity of Jesus. And I don't dispute it. But we can't be so bent on saying Jesus is fully divine that we ignore his humanity. And yet that seems to be what's going on here. Jesus' response to Lazarus' death was a human response, pure and simple. We need to remind ourselves, too, that when the early church was grappling with this doctrine of the virgin birth that we now claim and cling to, they weren't doing it to prove that Jesus was divine. In fact, their reasoning was the exact opposite. There were people who were saying, Jesus really wasn't human. He was a spirit that just kind of floated around. So when he died on the cross, he didn't really die because he was a spirit. And they pointed out that being born of the Virgin Mary reminds us that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. One of the other things Jesus does in this passage that I, I find very powerful is he meets people where they are. He doesn't try to tell them, you got to come to this place or you got to do this thing. He goes to them. He goes to the crowds. He goes to the people that are sick. And when they come up to him because he's in their region, he doesn't turn them away. Too many times in the church, we have this attitude that's left over from the 50s and 60s that all we need to do is open our doors and they'll all come swarming in. It doesn't work that way anymore, does it? If you don't believe me, look around and you'll realize it doesn't work that way. We as the church need to be more active in going to the people. We need to be more active in reaching out to others where they are, rather than expecting them to come to us. You know, we do a lot of that here at Grace, and i got to tell you, I'm proud of that. But could we do more? Of course. We can always do more. But meeting people where they are is how ministry truly happens. Touching lives that are hurting is one way that we share this good news of Jesus Christ. But the other thing that we do when we share this good news is we share new life. We give people who are hurting a chance to look at life in a much different perspective. 
We let them know that we love them, that we care, that they are important to us. You and I are here because somebody loved us and cared about us and let us know how important we are. That's what we're called to do. It's who we are called to be. That's what I've gleaned from the story we commonly call the raising of Lazarus. Amen.